Outrocast. Congratulations on Tribeca. How long did you have to keep that a secret that you were accepted to Tribeca? Oh, I think it was about six weeks, and it was it was really exciting. It's you know we've um, I've been producing and directing documentaries for a while, and and we've gotten mm -hmm. into some pretty good festivals, but this is the first time you know we've been been in something like Tribeca. I mean, Tribeca is the you know at the top of the mountain alongside of Sundance, right? It kind of sets the bar high in a way. And <laughs> did you have to do any special preparation besides doing press like this for the sake of Tribeca? Um, interesting question. I mean, you know, I think the thing is, is that we've been so focused on getting the movie done. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what we submitted to Tribeca was like a, a very watchable, but still not finished cut. And if, if you know, if, you, if you've had a chance to watch the film, then, you know, there's quite a bit of visual effects. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I'm a producer along with Justin Bergeron and Troy and and, and Sean did just a beautiful job directing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also put on my colorist hat because I came up through post-production. So it was kind of a nice time to, um, that was what I was doing in prep for Tribeca, like fine tuning the film grain and the and making sure that the, the image really felt cinematic and, and working with Sean to, to, to just get it, you know, there's always that last 5% of the process where it goes from, it be, it starts to feel like a movie, you know, with the, the final sound mix and the visual effects and all those things. Sometimes I hear the coloring is the last step. Sometimes it's replacing the temp music cues with what you really wanted in there. Was it the coloring as the, as the final step for you? It was the combination we were, it was all hands on deck because, you know, the, the entire post-production process we handled internally. Mm -hmm. So we go out to any, um, any uh, facilities. So, so that actually was fun because it stretched several of us. So like the sound mix and design, which I really think came out spectacularly. That was, you know, that was done by Jesse Bennett, who's on our staff and is a, you know, and sort of is like a switch hitter between you know, being an associate producer and doing audio. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I've done a fair amount of color grading, but, um, and I came up through, you know, when I was at Nickelodeon, I started off as a motion graphics artist. So I, I love that part of the process because post is where the storytelling happens. So, you know, it was kind of my chance as a producer to just, you know, I could impact it and, and have that last look and like talk to Sean about the, you know, where there was an area that um, mm -hmm. just like a little bit of nudging and, hey, what do you think of this versus that? So um, those things were kind of all happening at the same time. Yeah, you said one of the magic words right there, Nickelodeon. And I am a former Viacomer myself. Oh, was, yeah. uh, to, to stereotype here, you learn when you speak with Viacom people, they're used to delivering things early and under budget because you've been not allotted a lot of resources to get things done. You learn to be scrappy. Where in where uh, where in the Viacom verse were you? Did you did you enjoy your time? Where was your playpen? Enjoyed the time in music and media licensing, where oh. <laughs> where they take a six figure check from a Reese's or a Pepsi or something like that to do an album premiere, and then they tell you that the clearance budget is two hundred bucks <laughs> to premiere the A-list artist content, and you have to wrangle it back and forth. I'm just going to have to assume that that chapter of your career really prepared you for everything, the Viacom. It's almost like the joining the military part of TV and media production. Well, you know, it, this is the thing. So I, I went to film school. I come out, and this spunky little Italian girl I went to school with, Angela Caccioni from Bayonne, New Jersey, calls oh, yeah. me up and says, you know, she got a job at MTV Animation where she had interned. And so I, I entered as a PA. She's like, you worked hard. You want to, yeah, hey, we got a PA position. Come on in. And I basically stayed in Viacom in New York at multiple channels for, for like 13 years. So it was at MTV, first in commercials and then in the animation series development. And then that all got destroyed in the dot-com bust. And then I moved to Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. And then I was part of the, really the early team at Spike TV because the Nickelodeon leadership basically- oh. Built Spike. So my boss yes. Nick went to Spike. And then I I came up, you know, came upstairs, so to speak, in 1515. Oh yeah. And one of the things to kind of bring it back to what we're talking about is 
when I was at Nickel when I was at Spike, I was one of the two creative directors in the promos department. M my favorite project was for five years, I ran and ended up directing all the spots for these, this pro-social campaign called True Dads. It was sort of the, in a world of like, like, you know, Maxim Magazine level, like nothing in Spike could even, you know, if you, if you attempted to put Spike on the yeah. air today, you would be accused of a hate crime. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong about that. The the man show would never another Viacom property would not have been great. Oh no, we had we had Mansers and a thousand ways to die and all this all this crazy crap. Yeah, and, I love that channel. Um, <laughs> but but, but you're yeah, right. I was like the warm hearted, the warm hearted, like lighter touch comedic part of my portfolio was this dad's program. So that when we launched Dad Saves America last year, it was sort of like. We've kept the best of Spike. We even kind of nod to Spike in our branding with our orange and black color. Oh. So, so, um, so yeah. So that's and that's you know that's how the Troy documentary came about because we brought Troy on our on the talk show I host, Dad Saves America, and then you know pitched him to translate his story into a documentary. And um, brilliant went, full yeah. circle movement right there. So to my father. The, as an outsider, as the general populace, the fair respective media right here, I know it's coming to Tribeca, but how far ahead are you planning in terms of it? Is it going to tour? Does it go to theaters or where is it at? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing, right? You know, short films, um, short films are a weird product. You know, you're not going to take it to theaters unless you're going to be, unless you're going to be in some kind of, um, in, in some kind of film festival, because who's going to the movies and paying to watch twenty minutes? It's it, you'll spend more than twenty minutes on the on the previews, right? Um, I guess you could ask who's going to the theaters in general, but that's another story. Fair. Fair. <laughs> um, you know, we you know the final destination is probably going to be on our YouTube channel, but I think given this incredible opportunity with Tribeca and some of the response we've been getting so mm -hmm. far. We certainly want to give this film the opportunity to earn, you know, earn earn its laurels, so to speak. And so we're going to make a festival run through the summer. And um, we've actually had some pretty exciting outreaches from potential distribution outlets that are, you know, publishers and and you know, big brand like sort of new media outlets and and things like that. So I think we're going to have to weigh what the best, you know, how can the film do the most good reach the most people and make the biggest impact, you know? So there's that there's dad saves America. Are you allowed to say what else you're working on or is it all under embargoes for the foreseeable future? Oh, no, well, so let's see. What can I share with you from the well, lab? That's, that's a legitimate question you have to ask in these junkets. Cause a lot of time you speak to the town and you go, what's coming up next. And they tell you, and then you get a polite email or call. By the way, you have to edit out all this because it's not announced. Well, you know, so <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm a producer, but I'm also I run an organization, which is Emergent Order Foundation. It's a nonprofit sort of mm -hmm. mission-driven production company, effectively. And mm -hmm. so we've got a lot of different things. We've got our Dad Saves America uh, show, which is on YouTube, and um, also talking to other possible places to get the the, the message out. Um, we're also in the lab on sequels to what I think are still in some ways my most successful projects, which are these rap videos that pit economists against each other. <laughs> and uh, so we've got like 20 million views across three textbook grade macroeconomics interviews. But I think, um, so that's something, I think one of the most exciting things happening though, is we've just got some incredible guests coming up on Dad Saves America. I just like literally this morning shot a great interview with um, Damon John from uh, Shark Tank. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I gosh, I don't even know what time is all a blur these days, but we were, we shot with Danny DeVito and his daughter about their upcoming play that's going to debut in, in the fall on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Akbar Baja B. Amila from American Ninja Warrior, whose parents, um, it's a great dad story, and his parents are uh, these Nigerian first-generation immigrants that raised him in South Central LA in the 90s. Everything about his story is kind of incredible. 
So we've got a lot of awesome stuff coming up through the Dad Saves America channel. Most people who are doing the Tribeca junkets, that's all they got. Not you, John. There's <laughs> there's a little too much. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a out. torrent. <laughs> And and then, well, uh, at the end of the day, like I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so that's the the problem is you are always thinking about 14 ideas and two or three of them you can advance. But you know, it's like any producer, you're always, you're popping up plates to spin while these other ones over here are wobbling, and then you go and <laughs> try to keep them spinning. And yeah, and you're doing all this without a B action movie star uh, fronted sequels. Your sequels don't have those in them. <laughs> I should be so lucky as to have B movie action stars. If I can find a way to get Van Dam, if you know Van Dam, I will. The invite is out to come on Dad Saves America and talk about um, how to grapple with masculinity. I think that'd be an amazing conversation. Wow. Well, the last question I have for you before I let you go, putting you on the spot here, is there another Tribeca screening or event that you will be checking out or looking to go to if you have the time? It's that's a good question. I don't have a good answer. Um, that morning of our screen, so our screenings next Thursday at eight fifteen is the first one with the red carpet, which is all kind of fun and neat. And um, and that morning we're going to be on uh, the Today Show, Troy and I, and so that's going to be cool. And I, I don't know. It's going to be a crazy week. It's going to be a little. It's going to be hectic. So I'm going to try to get to as much as I can. I'm bringing my wife, Lisa, who's a part of the team, and my 18-year-old son, Mateo. And he's definitely excited to check out some of the awesome music stuff going on. So we've definitely made it a family affair, which is fitting for, for To My Father. Outro.